So this kind of, the, the topic for this presentation kind of came out of the fact that I, I kind of feel like I'm having this conversation with my clients all the time and it dates back to my very, very first client and my very first job out of graduate school. Um, I was invited to intern at a marketing company and the whole point of my internship was the, uh, my boss wanted us to land this, what he thought was gonna be a really, really big client. Um, They're launching a new product in LA. It was associated with a big brand, but it was licensed out. Uh, we were gonna be launching from Houston, but in LA. So he just said, Scooter, if you can land this client, I'll totally hire you and you can run with it. And I thought, cool. you know. So I landed the client, I got hired, um, but my client had no budget. And so he said, I just want you to do social media. I hear it's free and you're gonna make me famous, right? And I was like, I'll do my best, you know? <laughs> so I launched his Facebook page and he had his custom URL and he did get some traction and he got some fans and every time we talked about it, he said, Scooter, it's not enough, I want more fans. And every time I said, you're right, it's not enough, you do need more fans, I need money. And the answer was always no and he has social media is supposed to be free and this became really, really frustrating for me, especially trying to launch this product in LA from Houston. So. I want to cover three basic things. Um, one, rethinking the cost of social media, and then how you can plan your budget. I can't plan your budget for you, but I can give you some really good pointers and tips on how to approach it. And then everybody always wants to know about how to measure the ROI of social media. So rethinking the cost. I've got a couple of statistics that show me some but I think something is pretty important. So I've got 43% of US companies are successfully finding US new business um, with social media marketing. That's not 43% of companies that are actively using social media. That's 43% of companies. And that's new business. And that's kind of a big deal. And we're seeing um, a gradual move from people kind of just sort of dipping their toes in social media to moving towards a full-blown social media implementation. And I can see that because in 2011, social media marketing will account for up to 10% of full-blown marketing budget. 10% is a pretty good chunk. That's not small. And we're seeing it rise um, about 3% from last year. And it's anticipated to be about 18% in the next five years. So we're seeing that companies are not only finding new business, but they're acknowledging that they're finding new business and that there is value in social media and they're throwing more money at it because it's valuable for them. So I wanna kind of illustrate where does this money go by taking a look at some companies that are effectively using social media and kind of breaking down where that cost is coming from because yes, it does, doesn't cost any money to sign up for an account on Facebook or even to kind of give my brand a little bit of a presence, but beyond that, there's money pretty much associated with anything that you wanna do. So. Coca-Cola actually has a pretty killer Facebook page. And now I'm not saying you need to be Coca-Cola. They obviously have a much bigger marketing budget than probably anybody in this room. But we can kind of break down um, why this is so expensive. So we see really, really good use of graphic design. Um, what you don't see kind of at the bottom left over here, are all their extra custom tabs, which I put up over here. And um, from here, I can share Coca-Cola virtually with my friends. I can download exclusive content. I can do something with bubbles even. I can read about Coca-Cola in a million different languages. I can spend hours on this page. But what I don't see kind of right away is what went into that. So that's graphic design. That's a lot of development and coding. That's a big learning curve to keep up with Facebook and keep the technology current. Um, we've got the house rules kind of over there on the right that absolutely had to have legal counsel involved with it. So uh, as I kind of break it down, I see that there's definitely a lot of cost associated with this. Okay, moving on. But the reason, like I said, nobody's saying you need to be Coca-Cola, but the reason you do want to pay attention to your Facebook fan page, now that I've made it sound really, really expensive, the reason that you do want to go ahead and invest some money in it is because just like your website is the hub of your online presence, and just like people Google you and try to find your website to kind of make you, it makes you a legit brand, right? Your Facebook fan page is the hub of your social media presence and it's not polished and it doesn't represent you as a brand and who you are. It kind of takes a little bit of your legitimacy away and I think that's especially true of B2C companies. And also, because social media is so popular and social networking so um, kind of everywhere, and with the, the, the open communication and the transparency that everybody loves about social media, I think not having 
your brand represented on Facebook almost seems fishy, kind of like you have something to hide. And another reason you want to claim your Facebook fan page is because if you don't, your fans will. We've seen it time and again, and it actually happened with Coca-Cola. They didn't have a Facebook fan page right away. Some of their fans went looking on Facebook for their page. They couldn't find it, so they made one for them. Um, Coca-Cola you know, j eventually got it back and kind of owned it and, and whatever, but you want to definitely be in control of your brand, especially in this kind of open communication environment. It's also the home of your promotions. You need somewhere pretty and nice to drive everybody back to when you're creating content on Facebook. It's a gateway to your website, which is kind of ultimately where you get your conversions online. And it's also really good for search engine optimization. While Facebook doesn't kind of give you link juice when people click through to your website from Facebook, it'll help you get on the first page of uh, Google analytics if you have your custom URL because Facebook obviously has a lot of good search and optimization associated with it. So now that we've kind of spent all this time talking about how important your Facebook fan page is, there's, there's a kind of a cold reality in Facebook. Once somebody initially likes your brand and after they land there for the first time, uh, statistics show that users aren't really inclined to ever or frequently at least go back to your Facebook fan page. So what that means is that you have to spend a lot of time really, really trying to get into their news feed because that's where you're going to make the impressions and that's where they're going to read your content and communicate and engage with your brand online. We all saw the introduction of the Twitter a week or, or the ticker rather uh, a week or two ago. And this makes it even harder for you to make it into somebody's actual news feed. So what you have to do is spend a lot more time engaging people online and and spreading your message around so that you can make the news feed and have more opportunities for people to like and comment on your post and end up at least in the ticker. What this also means is you're probably going to want to run promotions more frequently to encourage people to share your content for incentives like exclusive downloads or discounts or things like that. And obviously, there's going to be money associated with that. The reason the, the news feed is so important, and I've just got a couple of statistics I'll just read out to you. Um, Facebook accounts for 90% of, uh, of, of time spent on social networking. I'm not going to elaborate on that because I think that number speaks for itself. Um, and the news feed actually accounts for 4% of all time spent online in general. And I think that's pretty significant. Uh, users, when they're, when they're on uh, Facebook, are 40 to 150 times uh, more likely to consume your content on the news feed than to actually go back and visit your page. And the reason that number f fluctuates so much is each brand is a little bit different and each brand, uh, some brands encourage people to visit their pages more than others. And I think that the big one here is that the average Facebook user has 130 friends. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but anytime somebody likes or comments on a post or shares something, it posts to their wall and subsequently to their, uh, your ticker or your news feed. So every time I like something, if I have 130 friends, 130 people, a potential of 130 people can be exposed to the, your brand. So pretty much, and we'll break it down a little bit more and you'll see kind of how viral and how, how, how much you can multiply your impressions. So. Especially for new brands, and because the tickers are the newsfeed rather is becoming more and more competitive, another cost associated with Facebook is going to be the sponsored stories. So you can, you can buy a couple of different types of that on Facebook, and that top one you see is a sponsored story. So I can basically tell Facebook that I want to pay them to kind of push any sort of little actions that people take on my Facebook fan page or on my content, like liking it or commenting it into the sidebar of their friends. So I can probably see, I'm like, okay, Heather likes, what is that, seventh generation, maybe I want to like it too. And I don't even have to go that far away. I can like it straight uh, from this page right here. And then we've got the sponsored ads, which also kind of come in with that built-in endorsement. So this isn't a sponsored story. They've provided the image and the copy for it. But I can also see, well, Brian Truax likes Netflix right under there. Maybe I want to like Netflix too. So while the click-through rate on these sponsored um, ads and stories aren't super high on Facebook, I think they're really valuable because the impressions have built-in endorsements, and I feel like they go a little bit further. And in fact, because of that, 
Facebook is actually working with Nielsen right now to come up with what they feel will be a better metric for measuring the value of these ads rather than just the typical click-through rate, which is what we normally use for online advertising. So again, the newsfeed is getting more and more competitive, so these sponsored stories can be really, really valuable. They have the built-in endorsements, and really they're flexible and easy to use. Facebook has a really intuitive interface when it comes to buying these ads, and you can target and you know kind of a, do a lot of A-B testing, like try this market and try that market, um, and try different content, and you can change it at will and stop doing it if it's just not working for you. So we kind of talked about what kind of goes into Facebook, and I can go on and on about Facebook forever, but we've got strategy, we've got design, content creation, development and hosting, especially for the special um, tabs and iframes. Using third-party apps can be pretty expensive for running promotions, doing research and getting legal counsel. And I think most of all time, I think what we kind of pointed out here is all of this stuff is very time consuming. And I know my time's not free. So that's kind of what goes into Facebook. And I want to talk a little bit about Twitter. Twitter's a much different animal than Facebook. It's a smaller, more intimate community, uh, full more of kind of loyal fo followers. Um, but I think the biggest difference between Facebook and Twitter is the frequency with which people tweet. And what that means for you as a marketer is that you have to tweet a lot more often to get into the newsfeed. The shelf life of any given post is much shorter. So you have to spend a lot more time doing research on timing of tweets and what kind of content people want to see and getting it up there at the right times and more frequently. And because it's kind of like this closer, more intimate community, it's also really good for knowledge sharing and it's really good for customer service. So what that means is you're probably going to want to spend some time searching through Twitter and seeing if you can provide value for your potential or actual fans and customers out there and tweeting at them and kind of developing that connection. I am running on reserve battery power. And what kind of keeping up with all of that looks like is this. So I want to make sure that I'm posting relevant content and posting it frequently. So I want to sign up for Google Alerts so that I can keep up with all the latest stuff that's going on in my industry or things that are relevant to my brand. I want to follow blogs of people who might be influential. I want to sign up for Google Reader. I also probably want to sign up for Hootsuite and Sprout Social because I don't want to have to sit there and tweet all the time and be constantly glued to Twitter. I want to be able to schedule my tweets ahead of time, schedule them carefully. And I want to be able to go back and look. You always want to be evaluating how you're doing. So I can kind of try posting different types of content and seeing how well received they are um, at different times of day and um, always adapt and kind of modify my plan to make sure that I'm getting the best return on my time that I'm investing in a Twitter. And to kind of break down what this looks like just a little bit more, we can see what a week of Twitter might look like. So I'm doing content research, I'm keeping up with my Google Reader, I'm archiving all these stories, I might want to write some blog posts that I can link to. So my content research, let's say I spend about two hours, and then coming up with three to five tweets per day that are really, really relevant and kind of hit close to home. And then I want to monitor Twitter, right? I want to search and make sure that their people aren't talking about me or to me, um, that there's nothing that I don't need to be addressing. And then the third party apps, Guys, these, some of them are $0 a month, but they, st I mean, Tracker's like $500 a month. And what Tracker will do will help you identify the influential people that you want to be talking to on Twitter. There's a, mil a million different apps out there, but they can be very expensive. And then, of course, I want to log into my Sprout Socials or my other analytics tools and see how I'm doing and make sure that I'm on the right track. So whether I'm doing this in-house or I'm outsourcing the work, I can see that this definitely can be really time consuming. And this is not for everybody. This is to really own Twitter. But if you want to break it down, for sure there's time and money and cost associated with that. Um, so I talked a little bit about the, um, the Twitter tools that you can use. But there's a whole social media toolbox out there for you guys. There's a lot of really cool third-party apps that make building those custom iframes that are so pretty and cool on Facebook really, really simple. They help light gate your content and help you um, provide exclusive downloads and things like that. So I don't want to get too much into them. I just want to talk about the fact that they exist. And they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. We've got ones for Twitter, ones for Facebook. The ones for listening are really, really cool. 
they'll measure what people are talking about on your uh, brand all over the internet, just not on social media. And then what they'll do is take all the words around it and what that looks like and say whether people think about your brand positively or negatively, and if they're thinking about it negatively, why? So that you know that you can be posting content out there um, to kind of combat that. And they'll also look at your competitors for you which is also, that's pretty cool. So I've got tracking, I wanna look at my Google Analytics, I wanna make sure I've got my Bitly links and everything, and we've got content creation tools. And I know a Radian 6, which is a really, really cool listening tool, that starts for one user at $600 a month. You can go far with it, and the analytics are amazing. But if you really, really wanna dive into social media and own it, go full force, it's, it's gonna definitely cost you some money. So I just kind of want to touch on this. You want to make sure that you're definitely full. As you're evolving your social media plan, that you're folding it in with the rest of your online and offline marketing. And that's going to take a little bit of time and money. You want to make sure that you connect with your Facebook and your Twitter and all those things on your website, the logos on your other marketing materials and things like that. It's just um, integrating it with the full marketing mix. So this kind of seems like a lot of trouble. <laughs> and it seems like really expensive, so why would I want to do it? Social media marketing is projected to be about 10% of all online marketing um, coming up this year, and that's a $3.08 billion spend. And this is just to kind of reiterate some of the statistics that we talked about earlier. And organizations are increasing certain aspects of their social media marketing budget from 18 to 95%. So again, what that tells me is yes, it's totally worth it because companies are out there, they're on social media, they're being successful, and they're throwing more money at it because they're seeing value. And I think that some of that value comes from the fact that with traditional media, you only really get to communicate at your audience, right? So if I'm a commercial and I've got 30 seconds, I get to pick my message and kind of target market this very niche sort of people and try to get them to relate to me. And if I'm not watching or listening in that time, I certainly haven't opted in for that content, right? The impression's lost and I, I missed my chance. And we'll kind of illustrate this with a commercial. There's nothing special about this commercial, um, but we can, I think, understand this a little bit better. I think I have to click on this, let's see. Well, basically, this video is just of a really, really kind of um, anal retentive mother. She's sitting on a couch, and she's watching her, like, three-year-old daughter play. And the daughter's all dressed in a camo hoodie, and she's playing with, like, um, I think G.I. Joes and stuff like that. And she's, the mother's super uncomfortable with it, and she's saying she really, really hates the fact that her kid's always out there getting dirty. You've seen this commercial? Okay, she's out there getting dirty, and, and she has to spend all this time on her laundry. And so me, as a as, you know, single woman without any kids, I'm kind of not really relating to this, um, this commercial, and the impression's totally lost. And what I can't do is say, hey, Tide, um, I'm a single woman without any kids. Does Tide work for me, too? And if I feel frustrated and if I want to be judgy about this commercial, I can't say, hey, Ty, don't you think you're stereotyping moms? Or don't you think there's kind of homophobic undertones in this commercial? I can't say any of that. And Ty doesn't have the opportunity to respond back to me. So the impression's completely lost. And if one is left, it's probably not positive. Alternatively, with social media, you get to communicate with your audience. Okay, so not only are you making brand impressions all over the place, but they've opted in, so they're already more engaged than the person watching that Tide commercial. So I just kind of grabbed a post from uh, a Cheetos last week, and they have, I mean, they have a big following, but they're not in the millions or anything like that. So Chester the Cheetah is their voice online, and Chester says, how do you like the self-portrait? I drew it with my non-dominant paw. Aren't those eyes dreamy? Chester. This is a silly drawing that probably took somebody five minutes. But here's what it did. It had 621 likes, 18 shares, 56 comments, and nine like comments. That comes out to a total of 705 actions taken on this one post. Because we saw earlier that the average Facebook user has 130 friends, this multiplies out to 91,650 potential brand impressions. 
they're not just brain impressions. They're opted in brain impressions or they're brain impressions from somebody who somebody else already likes and knows and trusts, right? So this kind of goes a lot further. So if I want to go up against uh, radio, the production time of this Facebook post, I'm going to say if we're billing, at a work, we're saying my time is worth $100 an hour. That probably took somebody 20, 30 minutes to draw that picture max and to post. So that's about half an hour, which comes out to $50 for production. Monitoring time for all of those comments, I'm gonna, I'm gonna estimate it an hour, so I spent one and a half hours on this social media, um, imp the social media impression, so that comes out to $150. I've got potential brand uh, imp impressions of 91,650, which gives me a CPM or a cost per thousand impressions of $0.002, and that's like nothing. Now, I understand that the numbers here with Facebook and radio aren't apples and apples, and I'll address that in a second. But I know that from reading, and I feel like this number is a little inflated. I know I produced radio commercials for as little as a few thousand dollars, but those were like local car dealerships where the voiceover talent was just the car dealer and, and stuff like that. But if I want a big national campaign, and I want the best copywriters on it, and I want the best, best, video, or the best voiceover talent, whatever, the average radio commercial um, for a 30 second spot is 30 to $50,000. Production time is two to four weeks and um, an average drive time spot in Houston in the morning for 30 seconds goes at $335 a pop. So this comes out to a huge total and if I, but I get a potential impressions here of 138,600 and this number just so you know is from, I got from 104.1K every day, the Rula and Ryan show in the morning. So they're the biggest one in Texas, they say it all the time, right? Um, this gives me a cost per thousand of 2189 to 3631. So this is obviously um, kind of inflated. We normally measure cost per thousand against just the cost of the spot. And what I'm not including in this Facebook, um, these Facebook numbers is the time that it took to get all of those fans that led to all of those comments and all of those likes and impressions. But I can see that the value got, went a lot further for me. And again, radio's not an opted in um, impression. These people are, are ready to listen to you. They want to listen to you. They logged onto Facebook to read the kinds of things that you're, gonna, that you're saying and that your friends are saying. So kind of so far what we've talked about is where does all this money go? And I didn't even get into blogging. I didn't get into LinkedIn. I didn't get into Yelp. I just kind of wanted to, to illustrate kind of where does some of that money that goes into social media come from. Um, we went into Facebook, Twitter, tools and integration why it's really, really worth it, and how it stacks up against traditional media. So now I want to kind of touch on budget, a budget planning breakdown. Now, like I said, I can't budget or, uh, for you. I can't tell you you need to spend this much because of um, what kind of business you're in. But I can give you different ways to look at your budget. A lot of people struggle with this. They don't really know where to begin with social media. So we'll cover just kind of different ways to look at it, in plain numbers, and things that you're going to definitely want to consider when you're doing your social media budget. Again, it's going to be totally different for, you know, B to, from B2B brands to B2C to organizations. But we can break it down by category, and I included this chart, um, not just because it has the numbers that I kind of mentioned before, the different, of how um, companies are increasing different aspects of their social media budget from 18 to 95%, but it breaks down the different categories for me pretty easily. So I've got things like internal soft costs, like staff to manage, research and development, training and education, which just like any other medium that never stops um, for social media. <coughs> I've got customer facing initiatives like the ads, um, you know, outsourcing my work um, and getting influencer and blogger programs. And then I've got technology investments We've got brand monitoring and social CRM and all of these things so that you can see what are the categories that I want my brand involved in, what, are, what things do I want my organization doing, and, and kind of break out how you want to spend the money from there. You can also break it down by platform. You can kind of look at your overall objectives and decide which platforms you really want to begin with and associate a certain amount with each one of those. And here are just a few of the platforms out there that you can invest in. If that seems really complicated for you, there is a simple formula that a lot of people use to, to get their marketing budget. Um, I don't think this works for everybody, but it could be a good place for you to start, kind of see this number, and then kind of apply your reality to it. 
and, and see where you want to go from there. So I can calculate 10% and 12% of my estimated gross sales and multiply each of those numbers by my markup. So if, um, let's say I sell toy giraffes and I sell them for $5 each, but I only pay $2.50 for each one, then my markup's 100%. I subtract my rent, which is my basic overhead, and then I'll take 10% of that for my social media marketing budget. Now, I'm taking 10% of that because statistics show that people are spending 10% of their marketing budget on social media. That doesn't mean 10% is the right number for you. I'm just kind of throwing it out there. It totally depends on the size of your organization. And to kind of look at that a little bit more closely and see it in real life, let's say my gross sales I project $5 million, and I picked $5 million because it's a small round number that's easy to work with. My markup's 100%, and my rent is $250,000 a year. So that means that my marketing budget, if I'm getting 10% and 12% of that, is uh, going to be $250,000 to $350,000, and then if I take 10% of that, I see that I have a social media marketing budget of twenty-five dollars to $35,000. Now, if your projected gross sales is $5 million a year, I might consider applying more of that to social media marketing because you're probably not going to get that far in traditional marketing with that kind of budget. So things to consider. Really, you shouldn't go any further. You should, we shouldn't even be talking about numbers until you know what it is you're trying to achieve on social media. What is a conversion to you? What is the end objective? Do you want to get people to your website? Do you want likes? Are you trying to build a loyalty program? What is it that you're trying to get out of your this program? Um, what is your overall marketing budget? And how are your current efforts working? In other words, if you're spending a lot of money in print, you're not really seeing an ROI on print, then move some of that budget around instead of adding to your marketing budget, right? Reallocate funds to make sure that your marketing is working the best for you. And what are your resources? Do you have the um, internal bandwidth to handle something like this on your own? Or do you have to reach out and get professional help? Or are you going to have to work with a third party and outsource it? Um, and then I, I always kind of want to say you need to pl plan to pad your social media budget because social media changes a lot. And I know that everybody's really frustrated with Facebook right now because they keep changing it. And as a marketer, it's equally frustrating um, and exciting to keep up with because things are changing all the time. And so I know that I need to kind of stop and breathe and adapt with the new ticker because that changes my reality as a person marketing on Facebook. So you want to make sure that you're keeping up with the changes and if, if, if some big change means that you need to kind of start using this third-party tool now, you want to make sure you have a little bit of wiggle room, just like any other marketing effort, in your budget to handle that reality. So three ways to measure ROI. Um, how do I know if my fans are really, really working for me, right? So first, uh, a, tr a few truths. Um, it's not a thing. ROI, measuring ROI, a hard number in social media doesn't exist. If anybody tells you they can give you that number, they're, they're lying. And I would argue, though, that kind of ROI in traditional media is also a myth. Um, I think that people say that we're able to measure ROI so, so well in traditional media is only because we've, ex we've accepted all of these old formulas as truths because we've been using them so long. But I don't think that you can tell me after a full-blown radio campaign analysis that you know for a fact that the number that you have wasn't influenced by the economy or some other huge market change. It, it, the, the numbers you can't get, are, they're just not exact. It doesn't uh, exist. And as social media changes, the way we measure ROI is going to change. It's going to keep, keep changing. But one thing I do know is that fans outspend non-fans by up to five times. That's kind of all I need to know to want to kind of invest in, in, in getting into social media. But because social media is really, really hard to measure online, and you're probably going to have your CFO on your case or your marketing director on your case asking for numbers. How is this? What is this doing for me? What have you done for me lately? I've got a couple formulas that you can throw at them to kind of keep them at bay. So you might want to write these down, and they might worth, be worth playing with. So I've got the media equivalent value formula. So I would take my social media impressions, and we kind of calculated what that looks like earlier, and multiply it by the equivalent, um, tar the equivalent targeted CPM. So we talked about you know, maybe what's my CPM for a radio ad that would give me 1,000 um, impressions. 
and then if I got a thousand impressions over here, I'd multiply the numbers that have my media equivalent value. And this will make your traditional marketing folks feel pretty good because now they're kind of working apples and apples, right? We've kind of taken the social media non-traditional marketing numbers and given them something that, that they're used to seeing they feel comfortable with. The next one is how much does it cost to get a fan? So I can take a proportional channel value, and again, I'm taking numbers that traditional marketing folks are used to working with and dealing with, and I'm multiplying it by the number of customers I've acquired, and I kind of see what that data value is. So let's say if I'm buying an email list or buying a mailing list so I can send out a direct uh, mailer, and it costs me five cents per name or something, I'm throwing out an arbitrary number and I know that I spent a month gaining 500 new fans on my Facebook fan page, I would do the math and I would get the data value and that might help your CFO feel a little more comfortable with what you've been spending so much time doing. And this one's pretty cool and it's a lot more complicated, but I think this one has a lot of value in it too. This one's from Dan Zarella. Um, he calls himself the social media scientist. He's totally worth following on Twitter or Facebook or um, He's got a couple of really short, easy to read books out that I would totally recommend. Um, I think his latest one is, it has bunnies on it. Um, <laughs> I can't remember the name of it, but it's about virality and things like that um, on social media. So uh, Facebook does have some built-in analytics with it, right? So I've got social media uh, insights kind of in the back end if you're a page administrator. So I can get my unlikes per month Basically, I'm calculating the average fan value for a Facebook fan. So I can calculate my unlikes per month and divide it by my total likes, and I get my churn rate. I would take one and divide it by my churn rate, and I get my fan lifetime length, which is my FFL. So I take my fan lifetime length, and I multiply it by the number of posts that I put out per day, and that equals my opportunities per fan. My opportunities per fan multiplied by my click-through rate gives me my clicks per fan, my clicks per fan by my conversion percentage. And again, you're gonna need to define what a conversion means for you early on before we even get past you know, the budget planning stage. And that's my sales per fan. And my sales per fan multiplied by the average dollar per sale is my average fan value. So those are a lot of steps, but it gets you a pretty, pretty cool number. And I actually went through this with one of um, my clients that I, um, I'm an administrator on their page. And I had a guess at like one of the numbers and I kind of shot low and I actually got a average fan value of $43.29. And there's a lot of numbers flying out around there about what it actually cost to get a Facebook fan. What is the worth of a Facebook fan? And the number that I'm seeing the most right now is one dollar and seven cents. So if I spend a dollar and seven cents and one of my fans gives me $43.29 back, I think that's an investment I'd wanna make. And most of all, um, kind of when you're in social media, you wanna remember to stay flexible. Again, it changes a lot. Your budget will change at the beginning of your fiscal year. If you say, I'm gonna spend this much money towards Facebook, I'm gonna spend X on Facebook and Y on Twitter and Z on blogging. Be prepared for your reality to change and be flexible to move those numbers around and kind of change how realistic your goals are as you move along. So the takeaways here, social media can be a major investment with a, um, with a major payoff associated with it. Um, you wanna carefully evaluate your brand resources and budget and you always wanna be able to evaluate and adapt and if that means that you need to spend a ton of time on Google Analytics or in Bitly or in, in, in your um, insights or getting a third party tool, you definitely want to invest in doing that. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, Dan Zarella, D-A-N-Z-A-R-R-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. He has a really, really good website. He tweets some stuff. He's a real talker, he doesn't beat around the bush ever. Katrina. Uh, I knew it was hierarchy of something, thank you Katrina. The the <laughs> They're cute, they're cute. Um, anyone else? Yes.
Yeah. So if you take your bit.ly link, let's say um, you can customize your own bit.ly links too. So if I say, because I go by scooter, if I make my bit.ly link, you know, bit.ly slash scooter, and I put that out there via Twitter and Facebook and wherever, what I can do later is just go bit.ly slash scooter and add a plus sign on the end of it. And it pulls up all these graphs of where your traffic came from. Um, yeah, so it's really cool, it's really valuable. You can see how many clicks it got and, and where all that traffic came from. And what that kind of tells you is, you know, where, where are people clicking through the most from? Was it Twitter, was it Facebook, was it my blog, you know, or whatever, and that really, really helps kind of shape the way that you kind of treat your social media efforts. Yes? I've kind of messed around with them a little bit, but not a whole lot, to be honest. Yeah, kind of. There's a lot of different formulas out there. Some of them are so complex. I know some of these felt like that last one that was like a lot. <laughs> it kind of, but um, uh, some of them are even more complex than that, so I don't want to get into those because they're kind of make you not want to do it. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't say he never borrows from people. He probably does, but he spends a lot of time doing, he, he, like I said, he calls himself the social media scientist. He does nothing but math all day long with social media. So, uh, but he doesn't talk about math all the time, so he is an interesting read. What was the name again? I'm sorry. Dan Zarella. He does, I actually had a webinar like a month ago. It was the biggest webinar ever in the world. It was like Guinness Book of World Records webinar. And it was the day of the hurricane, or the hurricane, the earthquake over there, what was in DC? And he was in DC. And it happened like 10 minutes before the webinar started and he still made it only like five minutes late. It's cool. Anyone else? Okay, well if y'all have any questions for me, I'll be walking around. Um, thanks for swinging by.